This is part one of a review of polynomial functions. This review covers AP Precalculus topics 1.4 to 1.6. If you appreciate this content, please don't forget to hit the like button. For the next few problems, we will use tables to determine the least possible degree of each polynomial. When the input values share a common difference like this, you can use a trick to find the degree of a polynomial based on a table of values. Find the differences in the output values. The first time you do this, we will call these the first differences. If the first difference is a constant, then it is a degree one polynomial. If the second difference is a constant, then it's degree two. If the third difference is a constant, then it's degree three, and so on. Neither the first differences nor the second differences are constant. So this polynomial is neither degree one nor degree two. However, the third differences are constant, so this polynomial is degree three. Pause the video and try number two on your own. The input values show a common difference, so we can use the trick. Looking at the output values, the first difference is not constant, so g of x is not degree one. However, the second degree is constant, so this polynomial is degree two. For number three, the input values show a common difference, so we can use the trick. Looking at the output values, the first differences are not constant, so h of x is not degree one. The second differences are not constant either, so it's not degree two. The third differences are not constant, so it's not degree three. However, the fourth differences are constant, so h of x is degree four. On number four, the input values do not show a common difference, so we can't use the trick that we've been using. We need to do something else. We are going to have to go by the actual rate of change, or perhaps the rate of change of the rate of change. So here's a chart that we learned earlier in the unit. If the rate of change is constant, then the function is linear, meaning degree one. If the rate of change of the rate of change is constant, then the original function is quadratic, meaning degree two. So let's see if it turns out to be one of these. To calculate the rate of change for each interval, we will need the output value differences. So here they are. The rate of change is the change in y divided by the change in x. In other words, the change in output value divided by the change in input value. So for this first interval, the rate of change will be one over one, which is one. For the next interval is three over three, that's one again. Five over five, seven over seven, and nine over nine. So we see that the rate of change is constant. Since the rate of change is constant, the function is linear. In other words, k of x is degree one. For the next few problems, we need to determine if the functions are even, odd, or neither. So we're not talking about degree, so looking at number five, the degree is three. That does not automatically mean that this is an odd function. When we say a function is even or odd, we're talking about symmetry. Quick side lesson. At a glance, we will know that a polynomial is an even function if all the exponents are even. That includes the fact that zero is an even number. So if we see a constant like five, that's really five x to the zero power. Um, that's going to be an even exponent. And uh, a function is going to be considered an odd function if all the exponents are odd. That includes if we see something like four x, that's really four x to the one power, so that's an odd exponent. If we see a mixture of even and odd exponents, then the polynomial is neither even nor odd. Look at number five. I see the exponent of three, that's odd. The next one has an exponent of one, still odd. But this constant is really nine x to the zero power, that's even because we have a mixture of odd and even exponents, then this will be neither. 
at a glance we can tell that function 6 is even because it has all even exponents. There's the 4, and then this negative 3 is times x to the 0 power, even and even. We know that number 7 will be an odd function because we have all odd exponents, 5, 3, and 1. So we can tell the answers at a glance. However, if they ask you to show or prove that a function is even, odd, or neither, we have to do more than just look at the exponents. If you are asked to show or prove whether a function is even, odd, or neither, we have to do it this way. A function will be even if f at negative x is equal to f of x. In other words, if we plug in negative x for all the x's and we get the original function back, then it's even. A function will be odd if f at negative x is equal to the opposite of f of x. In other words, if we plug negative x in for all the x's and we get the opposite function, then we know it's odd. Let's go back and redo number 6 as a proof. So we always start by plugging in negative x. So let's do f at negative x. That means everywhere you see an x, write negative x instead. So we have negative x to the fourth power minus 3. When you raise negative x to an even power, the negative goes away. If you raise negative x to an odd power, the negative stays, even without the parentheses. But in this case, we have the even power. So this negative goes away, and we have x to the fourth power. But then we notice this is the same as the original function. In other words, f at negative x is equal to f at x. All right, I'm just substituting f of x back in for x to the fourth power minus 3. Add on this conclusion. We say f of negative x is equal to f of x, so f of x is even. Let's redo number 7. We start with g at negative x. Substituting negative x in for all the x's, we have this. So remember, when we raise negative x to an odd power, the negative stays. So even without the parentheses, I'm going to have this extra negative. So this is going to be a negative times a negative, which will become a positive. So we will have positive 6x to the fifth power without the parentheses. Another negative exponent, sorry, another odd exponent, means that this negative will stay. It'll end up here in the front, so we will have negative 2x to the third power once we take the parentheses away. This last one doesn't have an exponent, so of course this negative stays. So we have a negative times a negative, which is a positive. So clearly this is not equal to the original function. But is it the opposite of the original function? To check and see if it's the opposite, we simply factor out a negative sign. So if we factor out a negative 1, that's going to change the signs of everything. So that's going to leave negative 6x to the 5th power plus 2x to the 3rd power and minus x. But when you look at what's inside the parentheses, notice that that is identical to the original question. In other words, g at negative x is equal to the opposite of g of x. So g of x is odd. And let's go back and redo number 5. So let's start by doing y at negative x. So that's going to be 2 times negative x to the third power minus 3 times negative x plus 9. So y at negative x equals because of the odd exponent, this negative stays. So I'm going to have negative 2x to the third power without parentheses. This one, there is no exponent. So this negative will definitely stay. We have a negative times a negative, which is a positive. 
and then we just have the 9. So first of all, does this equal the original function? Nope, the 9 matches, but then the other terms have opposite signs. Um, well, what about, does this equal the opposite of the original function? If we take out a negative sign to check that out, all the signs will change on the inside. So this would leave positive 2x to the third power minus 3x minus 9. Does the function inside the parentheses match the original equation? Well, the first two terms match, but the last term doesn't. So, here's the conclusion. Since y at negative x does not equal y, and y at negative x does not equal the opposite of y, y is neither even nor odd. Number eight, the graph of g is shown above. Notice that the domain is negative five to infinity. We have a closed circle over here at negative five, but on this side, it goes forever. Use the graph of g to answer the following, or write none. Part a, g has a local minimum at x equals blank. Local minimum is the same as relative minimum, by the way. So we see that we have a local or relative min here and here. It's just the bottom of any little valley. So we have one at x equals negative three, and four. So you should list both of those. G has a local maximum at x equals what? So um, we definitely have a local maximum here, right? That's at the top of a hill, so that's a local maximum. But any endpoint will also count as a local maximum. So this endpoint that is um, on a high point is also a local maximum. This will not count as a local max because it's an arrow, it really goes forever. So we're going to say g has a local max at x equals negative five and zero. The absolute maximum, which is also known as the global maximum of g, would be the highest point on the graph. Um, at a glance, it seems like maybe this would be the answer, but no, because of the arrow over here, uh, which tells us that this graph really goes on up forever. So this is not the highest point on the function. There is no highest point. So for this one, we really need to say none. The absolute or global minimum is the lowest point of a graph which we see to be right here. So we say the global minimum is, and now we say the y value. So the absolute minimum is negative three. And when they say at, we give the x value. So it's at x equals four. Number nine, part A. Find the average rate of change of f of x on the interval from negative five to negative two. On the interval from a to b, the average rate of change is given by f at b minus f at a divided by b minus a. This is really the same as good old y minus y over x minus x, which gave us the slope. It's gonna be the slope of the segment connecting the value of the function on the left side of the interval and the value of the function on the right side of the interval. So um, at negative five, we are here, focus your eyes on that dot, and then at negative two, we are here. Well, okay, we're, we're here, okay? Watch out, because it's a, we got this open circle, and it's really way, way up there. So uh, we're really talking about the slope of this segment. Using the formal formula, f at b, the value of the function uh, at the end of the interval is three, and f at a is negative three. And then b minus a is just the negative two minus negative five. 
This is really 3 plus 3, which is 6. And this is really negative 2 plus 5, which is 3. And that's going to simplify down to 2. Of course, um, because we have the graph like this, we could have just found the slope by thinking about rise over run. Uh, if we think in terms of rise over run, uh, this is up 6 and over 3. So that would give us 6 over 3, which equals 2 right away. But this is sort of the formal way to do it. So for part B, we need to find the average rate of change on the interval from 1 to 3. So at x equals 1, we are right here. At x equals 3, we are right here. So really, we're just finding the slope of this segment. Um, so I could do the formal rate of change formula, which is like y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Uh, but I already know what this is going to be, because just looking at the segment, uh, the slope, rise over run, this is down 1 over 2. So I know that that slope is going to end up being negative 1 half. Uh, but sure enough, if you simplify this out, negative 2 minus negative 1, you know that's going to be negative 2 plus 1 over 3 minus 1. And yeah, that simplifies down to negative 1 over 2. So that's the answer to part B. The average rate of change from 2 to 5. So 2, at x equals 2, the function is here. At x equals 5, the function is here. Since I was kind enough to give you a graph like this, um, let's cheat and skip to the final answer. The slope, rise over run. So this is up 5 over 3. So I know the rate of change is going to be 5 over 3. Notice that I know that it's going to be positive. Look at the way it's going uphill from left to right, so you know it's going to be positive. So if you wanted to actually show your work really formally, then now we're into um, y2 minus y1. So that would be 3 minus negative 2 um, over x minus x. So this is going to be 5 minus 2. And that would be 3 plus 2 over 5 minus 2, which sure enough gives you 5 over 3, just like we knew from the start. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but also if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link, which will take you to the whole unit playlist, or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.